Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Cosming and Freya, for the invitation to uh, participate in the conference. Uh, to begin with, I would like to offer my congratulations to the 20th anniversary of Parasite. It is a great honor for me to present some of my observations of the 1990s at the, as part of the discussion today. Two decades is long enough for an organization like Parasite to develop into a remarkable establishment as it is today. It is also long enough, if we think about the duration of two decades, for any number of ideas and perceptions and misunderstandings even to become fossilized. Like an organization, concepts, ideas, assumptions, misunderstandings can become fixations and thus acquire institutional power once they are internalized and become a part of the common knowledge of the past. And in turn, this will affect practice and value. And I'm going to examine some of the fixations and, and assumptions that we had about the 1990s. When I was asked to reconsider the 1990s of the last century in China, I decided to narrow down the scope of discussion to the period between 1988 and 1996. As we all know, historical developments are never clear cut. One should always be examining in an expanded frame periodization based on major political and social events or the unit of a decade is not always sufficient when it comes to historical examination. Today I'm starting with the two case studies as both practices spanned the period from 1988 to 1996. They are the new measurement group and the Qian uh, Wei Kang. The new measurement group consisted of three artist members, Chen Shaoxiong, uh, Chen Shaoping, sorry, Gu De Xin, and Wang Lu Yan in Beijing. And Qian Wei Kang was an artist based in Shanghai. I will show some slide images of an exhibition I curated in OCAT last year in collaboration with the artist Liu Ding and three research assistants, Qi Chang, Song Yichen, and Zhuo Muxi. This research exhibition was part of an ongoing investigation Liu Ding and I are undertaking to understand and outline the intellectual and ideological structures and fixations underlying contemporary art practice and discourse in China today. What we try to make visible through this research is the system of ideas and values which is the ultimate institution in the art world. So I'll show you the images. Um, basically, this exhibition consisted of two survey shows of the two practices. As I had mentioned, both practices ended in 1996. Qian Wei Kang stopped making any visual artworks after 1996 and no longer participated in any event of the art world. The new measurement group disbanded and the two members of the group Gu Dexin and Wang Luyan continue to work independently after that. They also have their own individual practices before while working in the group as well. But Chen Xiaoping, the third member of the group, uh, stopped his practice entirely after the group disbanded. Gu Dexin himself stopped making artworks after 2008. So the first um, exhibition, in, there were two exhibition spaces in OCAT, and in one of their spaces, we presented uh, the practice of Qian Wei Kang. Um, he basically made a number of 12 artworks during his entire career, and he uh, also made five proposals. But at the end of uh, 1996, he destroyed every piece of his artwork because he simply had no place to store them. All of the works were made site specifically. And as he, he stopped practicing and withdrew himself from the art world, he 
did not take any part in the reproduction of the works. So this reproduction of his works in the exhibition were based on our own research, investigation, and to a great extent, imagination as well. But we did make this um, gap visible throughout the exhibition, informing our audience that the works were based as a tool of our, re as a, re as a, a product of our research, not based on the artist's own instructions. And the works were destroyed after the exhibition. The first work you saw here was called uh, Leather Poem. It was very much the beginning of his practice before he started making any um, visual artworks in the exhibition space. This was done in the um, privacy of his own room in Shanghai. And we basically reimagined and restaged this action uh, in which he um, picked Render Me from a book of dictionary uh, characters and dropped them from a, a height after climbing to a ladder. And uh, based on the, lad the characters that fell on the floor, uh, he wrote his poems. It was called Ladder Poems. So we started the ex this exhibition with an imaginary and reenactment of a certain beginning of an artist's practice where the artist was very much fascinated by the idea of self-regulation, the idea of giving himself up to a kind of chance encounter, to chance forces, um, which continue to uh, run through his other works, as you will see. This was an image of the old work that he made, and this was a reproduction based on that image in our exhibition. This also. So in the years between 1992 and 1995, when Xian Wei Kang worked as a gallery, um, um, gallery staff in a school in Shanghai, called Shanghai Huashan Art School, he together with fellow artists uh, Shi Yong, make uh, two exhibitions together there. And in these two exhibitions, he, he got to realize nearly 90% of his works. And all of these works were made specifically for the gallery space. So when we reproduce the works, we also try to reproduce the height of the gallery space because it was in the basement. Um, we had the height from Shi Yong, uh, who gave us the height. The, so we painted a green line that ran through the exhibition space as an indication of a certain condition under which the artist worked at. And many of these sculptural pieces were made based on a self-imposed um, rule that the artist uh, uh, designated a certain amount of uh, white powder and he would always cry about leather, and he spread the powder, and the powder fell naturally from this height onto the um, metal sheets that he laid on the ground. We, we don't have much time, so I will not go through uh, all of his works in detail. The second practice that we were examining and, and rep representing in this exhibition was the Artist Collective in Beijing, a new measurement group. And you see uh, Chen Xiaoping, uh, Gu De Xing and Wang Luyan in their space. This was the living room of uh, Wang Luyan. Um, and on the wall, they also display. And the, the wall drawing was Wang Luyan's. Through the practice of uh, new measurement group, uh, they actually owed the only artworks uh, that they made were these five books. And actually, uh, none of them had a complete set of these five books, and not many people have them either. So it took us a very long time to assemble the complete set. But what was very interesting it was as we started the research, when we interviewed each of the artists, they actually forgot uh, many of the details and how each of the artwork 
uh, was was made exactly. So what we did was basically to re recreated a quasi new measurement group uh, with our research uh, members. We acted the new measurement group. We, we tried to recreate a situation in which they worked and we imagined that we went through the exact process of analysis to, um, to, um, to test, to see if what they claim was Right, and what they claim was basically through this process of five books, they created a set of rules that each of them enter as a, a number, as a as a as a letter, letter A B C. So the removal of the individuality, the removal of the individual, and through this set of rules, by applying this set of rules, at they submitted any kind of material, be it a, a, a menu, a, a, a recipe for cooking, an image of their own portrait. Um, they sub subjected uh, this data, this original data, random data that they, they chose through this process of analysis, which was uh, a form of that they call an A form. They enter this data into the A form through a series of filtering, through a series of analysis. At the end, what came up was something that has no meaning. It was either a graphic, some very strange character that you can't make sense of. So there was this very persistent uh, obsession with removing, removing meaning, remo removing any. Um, reference any dependence on our existing kind of experience of perception. And this was actually uh, the this origin of this kind of practice can be traced to one of the members, which was uh, Gu Dexing uh, in the late 1980s, exactly 1988 actually. He was always uh, mocked by his artist friends that he could not draw exactly. Uh, proportionally. So to counter that criticism, he began to measure his fellow artists, his friends, and he, he, he drew these um, sketches in his notebook, and he marked the exact measurement just to prove that he can draw proportionally. The second stage of their practice as a group before, before becoming a group, uh, Gu Dexing and Wang Luyan worked more closely together. And they did a series of uh, 16 photograph images called uh, Tactical Art, which was to um, imagine that you could only use graphic and um, characters to describe a certain um, physical or sense of Sen senses, a certain experiences with the world, but it was all very subjective description. So these were some of the example. Um, water touching the body, water in 30 degree touching the body. That's how they illustrated this idea. And that was the exhibition in which we presented uh, different phases of their practices. And I, here I just gave a very quick example of some of the content in the book. This was the fourth work that they did. This, at the beginning of the book, it was a set of rules that they would apply to this process of analysis. And this was the form uh, that they created in which they subject every kind of data. For instance, here was a recipe uh, for cooking chicken. They submitted this recipe towards the form and then through uh, a few layers of calculation, they called, or, or, or um, analysis, they came up with these words. That was the result of this process of analysis. Um, so we were attracted. So I show you the images of these uh, two practices. And, um, we were attracted to these two practices on a number of accounts. Um, these were two out outstanding examples of conceptual art practices in the 1990s. Both practices had an obsession, an insistence on self-imposed rule, 
and attempts to regulate and minimalize human agency in the making of their works. Their work reflected a consideration of a certain dialectical relationship between rational, being rational, being analytical, and being emotional, being subjective. All artists involved did not study or graduate from any art academy and were self-taught and were enrolled in art classes in places like the workers' cultural palaces. This was a kind of institution still existing, set up by the Communist Party after they founded the new Repu Republic of China to provide a space of learning and recreation in art, culture, and science for workers. Um, the artists involved in both practices were among the first few generations of artists to appear after the end of the Cultural Revolution. But unlike their predecessors who had been entrusted by the Communist Party with missions, in Chinese, 任务, with missions to work on a certain subject matter, these artists in these two practices never experienced a state of working that was driven by state dictated missions. In another word, they were missionless, 没有任务, without mission. They did not have to work from any given subject matter. Unlike their peers who came out of the academic system, they did not really have the mission either to rebel against a socialist tradition, socialist realist tradition that was part of the inher inherent training in our academies. But like their peers, they were sub exposed to the influx of Western thoughts and works in the 1980s. In both cases, the artist members pointed out the rising dominance, an active role of the market discourse in the art world in the 1990s as a pretext for their withdrawal. At this time, the art market in China was going through a critical shift. While from the end of the 1980s to the beginning of the 1990s, it was an emergent enterprise needed to be fostered and cultivated both by the government and by individual practitioners. It gradually, the market gradually turned into an extremely proactive and influential experience operator in the art system. So this was a certain context within which the artists work. Let us also look at several examples of works being done around this time, as we can see, trying to keep a certain distance in terms of emotion, subjectivity, and meaning in the making of the works was, a, in a way, a common thread. So we look at works by Geng Jianyi, um, Song, Song Ling, and Zhang Pei Li at the end of the 1990s. These were done in 1987. Um, sorry. Works by Wang Guangyi. Um, we can see that this idea of regulation, this idea of self-regulated, many works wanted to appear uh, appear as rational, appear as analytical. And actually, at this time, Wang Guangyi famously uh, published the article uh, to clean up the humanistic sentiment, the, the emotion in the art practice. But why this idea of reason? Why were artists were, uh, were attracted to the idea of reason, to the idea of alienation of human agency, emotion, and subjectivity? Why this sense of longing for order, for regulation? What is the relevance of such practice towards the more visible movements to come about in the early 1990s, such as the cynical realism, political pop, new literati paintings, and so on? In the following discussion, I will try to sketch out an artistic, intellectual, and social context within which these two practices came about. And here today, I'm already focusing on two very local threads of developments that contributed to their appearance. One is the advocacy of 
purification of language in art, and the other being the increasing dominant market practice in the art field. I would temporarily suggest 1988 as a point of beginning for our historical imagination. Not only that both practices started around this point, but as many historians have indicated, by this time, major social and intellectual transitions were well under its way that were harbingers for what was to come in the following decade. So why 1988? Since the turn of the 20th century, major cultural transformation in China had begun with a revolution, have always begun with the revolution of language, language in art, language in literature, in Wen Yi. For instance, the beginning of the literature revolution in 1917 was piloted by the American trained writer Hu Shi. The, um, he had called for the implementation of a vernacular prose in literature to which reformists such as Chen Duxiu and his contemporaries responded to pro positively. Collectively, they had propagated a new form of writing to recapitulate life experience in its immediacy and to appeal to a general public. Since the modern period, the issue of the artistic language had always occupied a critical position in China's political movements. Think the Yan'an uh, Culture and Art, um, Literature and Art Conference. Think Jiang Qing's um, model, model opera. It always started with the revolution of the language, Yi Shu de Yu Yan. When a stylistic, um, Sorry, it has been a political issue as much as it is an aesthetic one. In 1988, perceptive art critics such as Li Xianting were quick to spot yet another significant wave of changes set in the art world, which took the form of a debate on the subject of purification of language, Chen Hua Yu Yan in Chinese. As the discussion unfolded on all fronts, through artistic work, conferences, and written discussions appearing in art magazines, it became clear that advocates of purification of language were proposing a way of practicing art that divorces itself, divorces the aesthetic and stylistic concerns of art from concepts and content. The advocates were mainly from art academies. It arbitrarily equated any consideration beyond the stylistic aspect of artworks to that of politics and set up a dialectical relationship, a dualism between art and politics, between the artistic language and any concern of philosophical nature between form and meaning. In 1987, the first exhibition of Chinese oil paintings took place in Shanghai Art Museum. In this exhibition, there were two new trends of painting emerging, one of a classical style, as in Western classicism, the other abstraction art, abstract. If we look at the sequence of movements in painting in China after the end of the Cultural Revolution, we would notice the various attempts of painters to free themselves from constraints and legacy of the socialist realism. To do so, most Chinese painters took a very curious path, which was to go in the backward directions, to trace back within a simplified understanding of the Western tradition of painting referencing models of practice in Western classical painting tradition in search for the truth of painting. In essence, this was driven by their desire to break away from the revolutionary aesthetics and discourse of art from the Mao period. The classical trend and the abstract one were among such attempts. They arose at this time specifically in response to the 85 new wave art movement that happened two and three years before. 
This artist movement was a brief period of dynamic artistic experiments, inspired and heavily influenced by philosophical works and humanistic concepts translated from the West through the first half of the 1980s. Along with the emergence of these two prominent trends in painting, many artists and art critics, mostly from our academies, published articles criticizing the roughness of the stylistic and aesthetic language of artworks in the 85 movement, blaming philosophical concepts for hijacking artists' attention to the artistic language of their works, considering it tantamount to the politicization of art during the Mao period. In October 19, oh, sorry, at this juncture, Li Xianting invited Meng Lu Ding, an artist teaching in the Central Academy of Fine Art in Beijing, to write an essay entitled Purifying Language, questioning the insufficient attention artists had paid to the language of art meaning the technical and stylistic quality of art, while giving too much weight to conceptual consideration in art. This debate was intensified by an orchestrated confrontation of two positions, one advocated by Meng Lu Ding. I'm going to show you. Um, Meng Lu Ding, this was Meng Lu Ding's work, who switched from the, this work that he did in 1985 to abstract at this point, and he also wrote to support his position. The other position, the other oppositional position was offered by Li Xianting himself with the pen name of Hu Sun. He emphasized the artist's responsibility to give consideration and visibility to social and humanistic concerns called, he, he gave it a name, sorry. This was Meng Lu Ding's article, The Process of Purification, in the Fine Art Magazine. This was Li Xianting's article, also in the same magazine, in the same newspaper that he was the editor. Um, he called for the big soul as a response to what Meng Lu Ding wrote about the importance of keeping art to art, keeping art to itself. This very discussion around the issue of purification of language in art has also its equivalent in literature in China in the form of the advocacy of what's called pure literature or that of literature for the sake of literature as well as prevalent attempts emerging to rewrite a history of modern Chinese literature favoring works that were left out of the history of the revolutionary literature history. These intellectual movements in literature and art were driven by a compelling desire to break away from Mao's revolutionary tradition and that of the stiffened arts and literature system. This system came into being through Mao's period and had become stagnant and restrictive by the 1980s. Within this escape of a former discourse, there was also the aspiration among in Chinese intellectuals and artists to be modern, to establish a modern art history in China based on an un their understanding of the Western one. This discussion around purification of language turned out to be a process of reconstruction of a new ideological structure for literature and art in the following decades. Through this debate, the imposed oppositional dialectic between art and politics, between form and meaning, became a new system of common knowledge and assumptions. Furthermore, as the 85 New Wave movement demonstrated its close affiliation with philosophical concepts, the negation of revolutionary art tradition in the debate of purification of language went as far as to negate the relevance of intellectual ideas and practice, throwing it out together with politics. <laughs> 
ultimately, the consequences of purification of language did not lie in how it manifested and narrated itself, but in the fact that it went on to replace the subject that it criticized, which was on the surface the over-conceptualization of art at the cause of negligence of artistic language and deep down Mao's revolutionary tradition of art. Under the influence of purification of language, ideology free and depoliticized artworks became a new embodiment of political ideal itself. In the beginning of the 1990s, many of the artists internalized and answered such a call to purify language and make works that show a strong tendency of depoliticization and of voluntarily foregoing ideological content in their practice. Many turned to their everyday reality and merely stopped at representing the revolutionary legacy of Mao and his visual culture, as well as the contemporary reality with pop art aesthetics and approaches, and in a cynical and indifferent attitude. This gave rise to a generation of painters whose works were grouped into political pop, cynical realism, and the new bomb generation, Xinxian Dai. The artists were not taking a political stand in their painted subjects. Interestingly, the market that came about for these artworks was mostly consisting of sympathetic Western diplomats, businessmen, and Western museums. After a few international presentations, there rose an overbearing discourse rooted in the post-Cold War ideological perception for political art in China. So while these works were depoliticized, the narrative and consumption of them were derived from a political framework. The tendency of depoliticization both in the art world and in the society, were accelerated after the 1989 Tiananmen democracy movement. In 1988, economic reform was in operation. For many young people to engage in enterprise, to be an enterprise, either to work as a member of a company or to set up a business was not just an economic choice. It was an idealistic practice, an opportunity to be, become part of the era, to participate in the currents, a promising path to take. This enthusiasm was reinforced by the government's endorsement of risk-taking in economic adventures. But the leadership deliberately contained such enthusiasm and the sense of adventure within fields of technology and professional specialization, circumventing political discussions and imagination, and replacing them with pragmatic and technological aspirations. As a result, the political horizon was slipping away gradually from the public eye as well as from the mind of the intellectuals. The forced full crackdown of the 89th demonstration was just a drastic step towards removing the political horizon from the society. We know the story after that, the full-on development of the economy as a men's society obsession. The market practice and experiments in the art system since the 1980s and the enterprising practice from the beginning of the 1990s responded to such a social and political momentum. One of the exemplary practices was Lu Peng's editing of an art magazine entitled Art Market in 1991 and the organization of the first Guangzhou Biennale, which in nature, in practice, was an art fair. Oh, sorry. Sorry, the other. Oh, sorry, I, I 
give the wrong PPT, where I presented images of the, uh, the, the Biennale and the covers of the uh, magazine that he edited. Um, sorry. Um, so with this organization, this editing of the magazine and the organization of the Biennale in name, but actually an affair in nature, and some of the works actually went to Hong Kong and participated in the Art Hong Kong Fair in 1992 that Phoebe was talking about. This was practice and the creating of a discourse about market going hand in hand by artistic practitioners. In parallel to both the government's grand vision and the social climate that prioritizes market practice and emphasizes the idea, the spirit of pragmatism. This was also situated in the dualistic discourse about being modern and being or being versus being backward, being less advanced, being pragmatic versus being idealistic. In the vision, in their idealized vision, Lu Peng and his contemporaries saw market economy play a critical role in legitimizing artistic practice which at this time was always associated with a strong intellectual dimension and was subsequently being marginalized in the society. They were eager to foster an internal market for contemporary art, independent from that of the West. This operation, in fact, bore a very complex set of intentions, including a search, an assertion for cultural subjectivity through economic operations and cultivating of an internal evaluation and consumption system. This would turn out to be a process of de internationalization, even though the interactions of and exchanges with the Western art market and art world were just beginning to proliferate. So I argue that at this time, even though the contact, the exchanges between China and the West were just beginning, but in Philosophically, um, intellectually, the process of the internationalization was already taking off for, for Chinese art. As we look back after 1989, the government gradually, gradually implicated a great number of intellectuals and educated elites into the economic operations, supported by a certain extent of political access and privileges. Some of these people who would have otherwise taken to the street to request for political reforms and a more open society became so involved that they would also desire for a certain political stability and the privileges offered to them that their political vision was no longer about um, having radical and subversive perspective about existing order if they still have one. They became part of the existing order and wanted to consolidate it and not to challenge it. This illusion by the Tiananmen Democratic Uprising, many have already discarded the passionate idealism and metaphorical discussion of the 1980s. In its place, they tended to link the vision of a rational and a lead analytical and orderly system of approaches and thus a more open society to establishing an economic base. So economy was considered as a proposal, as a solution. In both public and private arenas in China, bureaucracy rules. According to a shared logic of political pacification, economic growth, and the narrow interests of elite class. During the 1990s, there was a liberal hope in China that the new enterprises would create a democratic vanguard, but they forgot that the new business elite was fully dependent on the one-party state and above all its ex exploitation of labor and class difference. In the art world, state-run art magazines gave considerable space to publishing new regulations of art fairs, reports, auction prices, as well as meetings that association of art critics held to determine a market price for art critical writing at this time. 
there was a pervading sense of excitement about the world and conception of business, which evoked a kind of formality, something that is regulated, orderly, manageable, and efficient, that can be taken seriously and that could yield a way of livelihood rather than a cultural and idealistic pursuit. Business activities became exceptionally present in the art world, as some of the early practitioners threw themselves wholeheartedly into the marketization of art, many also unconsciously switched between originally performing the role to becoming the role itself, becoming one with it. The general perception and historical narrative of the 1990s is thus dominated by accounts of market success and international recognition of a limited number of art movements. With this rise of international participation, another kind of anxiety will soon cast shadow over the Chinese art community. Many artists experience different levels of uneasiness in the encounter between China and the global art world, the intensified clashes between China and the Western cultures as a result of frequent contact at this point, as well as the onset of an overwhelming consumer culture. One of our protagonists, the Shanghai-based artist Qian Weikang, observed at this time, artists all changed. They were eager to participate in European exhibitions. International exchanges became a kind of vanity fair. One would not pay attention in Shang to Shanghai. They only pay attention to New York. Whatever art events were taking place in New York were immediately noticed in Shanghai. As to what was happening in Shanghai, no one really cared. I also ran into another issue. I had to accept the concept of the curator, or otherwise they would not give me the opportunity to show. I felt the artists had become actors. If I, had particip if I participate in an exhibition, I'm supposed to represent your subject. My work was working for you, working for the exhibition. I was slow in adjusting myself to it and could not live up to it. In his statement, we detect also a sense of uneasiness at this time towards the prof pro professionalization and industrialization of art and artists in China. Contemporary art practice became increasingly recognized as an industry in China at this time. During this process, the intellectuals and artists started to be removed away more and more from the political discourse and frontier in the society, both voluntarily and involuntarily. In the beginning of the 20th century, if we look back, there were a great sense of mission and urgency that had always informed and inspired the artists and intellectuals. There were always a sense of uh, that the artists were entrusted with uh, a sense of pro um, a, a sense of urgency to save the country, to fight the Japanese, to fight for the cause of the Communist Party. But after the end of the Cultural Revolution, the mission became a loss. The 1990s set in motion an alienation of artists and intellectuals from the political agenda of the government. Even though they were mobilized and implicated by such an agenda, they could no longer play a critical and active role in defining such an agenda. The perpetuation of pragmatism and the industrialization of intellectual and artistic practice aggravated such a divorce. In a way, the practice of new measurement group and Qian Weikang embodied a sensitivity towards and perhaps lamentation of such a loss of mission, an urgency in art. Instead, the artists perform the self in position of order and mission. But as they ended their practice, the mission was finally suspended and eventually vanished, as we experience deeply today. Thank you.